We're going to wrap up this very brief excursion into cognitive neuroscience by consideration of a different kind of neuron. These are variously known as von Economo neurons after their discoverer, Konstantin von Economo, who found them in 1929, or spindle cell neurons. So they've been known for a long time, and they were long thought to be unique to great apes. In fact, we've repeatedly noted that the brains of the great of other great apes differ very little from the brains of humans. Here we have a cell type which is found in the human, gorilla, orangutan, bonobo and chimpanzee brains that is not found, we believe, in monkeys, although perhaps if you have been recently found in macaque, we're not sure. Certainly they appear to be a very, very recent innovation in our own evolutionary lineage. Shown on the slide are a, a spindle cell on the left and a pyramidal cell on the right. I do this to point out that they have, they look very, very differently. This In the spindle cell, the nucleus is located about a quarter of the way from the bottom. Um, and there's a forking projection towards the bottom of that cell which is quite unlike the far more familiar dendritic axonal structure of the pyramid cell shown on the right. These cells are found in the anterior cingulate cortex, uh, orbitofrontal cortex, the front part of the brain, that mysterious front part of the brain, where the pyramidal cells are very, very well known. These were the ones that Golgi and Ramon Cajal had first imaged. Um, so we know we're very familiar with the morphology of pyramidal cells and spindle cells stand out by looking quite different. The part of the brain that they're found in, the anterior cingulate, the base of the frontal lobes and the periorbital just above the eye socket, these are parts of the brain that are very far from the sensory periphery. They have been implicated in all the mysteries of personality, consciousness and the brain. And you will frequently find reference in the literature dealing with the anterior cingulate cortex of, to something known quite wrongly as the social brain. We don't have multiple brains. We don't have reptilian brains. We don't have social brains. We have brains. Um, another way of looking at the anterior cingulate is as the dustbin of cognitive neuroscience where we attribute functions which we have no idea whether they exist or are real. Note the difference between the spindle cell neuron and the mirror neuron. The mirror neurons were defined on functional grounds. That is, there's no way to look at one of those cells and tell whether it's a mirror neuron or a non-mirror neuron. That distinction lies in the interpretation of the observer who attributes a function. So for example, this neuron is a mirror neuron because it seems to become particularly active in the course of goal-directed action, whereas its colleague, which looks exactly the same, doesn't. So mirror neurons are defined functionally, and von Economo neurons are defined morphologically on the basis of their appearance. That says nothing about what they do. I don't know what any neuron does. There is the five great apes, and just a little illustrative diagram showing the different spread and density of von Economo neurons in their respective cortices. Orangutans have the least and they're very sparsely distributed. Gorillas have a little more, chimpanzees and bonobos more yet, and humans have vastly more. And in humans we find them throughout the frontal lobes, the anterior singlet, the um, orbital cortex and the frontal cortex. And that would be enough to make these worthy of our, our attention. It's a cell type which seems to have originated with or shortly before the great apes. It's in a part of the brain whose workings are deeply mysterious. So here we have something which binds us together with our great ape cousins and separates us from those lesser monkeys and lemurs. But the story gets much more interesting. Not so long ago, spindle cells were found in the forebrain of a, hump, a female humpback whale. 
and since then they've been found in a number of other cetaceans, that's whales, porpoises, dolphins. Now, we say they're the same because histologists who special, specialize in identifying cell types find these in the homologous part of the brain with the same morphological characteristics. These are not functional definitions, but morphological definitions. Why would we find them in a whale? This suggests that they have evolved more than once, a process known as convergent evolution. Now, what is it about humpback whales that makes them resemble great apes? Well, in a sense, we see something very familiar in these animals. We see very, very rich social lives in which different social roles are distributed and shared. In humpback whale pods, the females collaboratively raise a lot of smaller calves who will grow up to either be these caring social females or the lone explorer male whales. We cannot speak with confidence of a link between any part of the brain and something as poorly defined as social function. But there is an encouragement here to seek the common commonalities between those who have similar evolved characteristics. Convergent evolution is always very interesting. When we look at the small mammals that inhabit deserts in different parts of the world, we find animals that have no recent common lineage, but nonetheless have very similar sets of features, nocturnal, big ears, hoppy feet. Um, and this speaks of the match between the organism and its lived world. Now, in the case of a desert, the world, the lived world poses certain physical challenges. These are probably not a response to a physical environment, but certainly they call our attention to the social nature of these creatures. And the story got more interesting when they were found in elephants. So now we have the same morpho morphology appearing in three separate lineages without common evolution. Elephants, of course, are extremely social and we empathize greatly with elephants. We understand a lot. We seem to share a lot socially with elephants. So there's mysteries here and I am going to be the last one to ascribe a function to these. But I will point out that as we look at the brain, we bring different questions with us. Some of those questions may be couched in function. Some of those questions may result from observing things like physical form as here, and they may give rise to really interesting questions that we didn't have. Here's a chance to let the brain speak back, as it were. The brain is telling us there's something interesting in this particular cell morphology that would encourage us to look for commonalities between the great apes, the cetaceans, and the elephants. That's just a little hint of some of the riches of cognitive neuroscience. Perhaps the biggest lesson to be learned here is that there's a fine line to be treaded between interpreting the brain and projecting one's preconceived ideas onto the brain. So as you're reading about brains, bear in mind that the public discourse around brains is typically very undisciplined, contains lots of wild unsubstantiated claims, um, that the science is very difficult, frequently misunderstood by both scientists and public, and that understanding brain literature requires a sharp, critical faculty that is aware of these difficulties.